MRL's incident command member, Dan Watts, declined an interview. When, when that, when it was, I mean, you, I'm just reading from your letter. You said the DEQ supports Plum Creek's decision and believes the temporary relocation would be in the best interest for all concerned. What, I'm just wondering about the people who live right there. Was a temporary relocation thought to be advisable for them as well? Um, what was probably done. it would have been based on how they felt, but uh, I don't recall ever, you know, those people may have left long ago. Uh, I simply don't know. There's no way you can prove any of this or anything, but it's just really obvious to you that the mental clarity, the sharpness, the concentration, it's just not there. I'll sit in school and kids that I have every day, all day long, sometimes have trouble remembering names. People say, oh, you're getting older and all that, but the difference is just really, you know, really noticeable. Now, I, I would imagine virtually everyone you've talked to has heightened chemical sensitivity. I think almost everyone I have. I, I even have some, and I was much less affected than he was, but I notice a lot more chemical sensitivity. He certainly has a, well, a oh, lot yeah. more, but uh, uh, everybody. As soon as we went into the emergency room, we were um, told that we all had reactive airways disease, and we followed through on our doctors, um, uh, Dr. Lemire for lung, um, which was with He's the reactive with the uh, reactive airways. Um, we seen an ear, nose, and throat doctor for the. Um, the sinus cavities and um, our throat and our ears. Um, there was burns there for myself and my sinus area down through the nasal passage. Um, for my husband, um, he had burns so bad that he lost his voice for two months. Um, our children, they had uh, burns. We have three children. They had burns on their sinuses um, and to their nasal passages, etc., down the back of their throat, too. Um, since the spill, uh, I've had chronic headaches on a daily basis, migraine headaches on a uh, fairly, fairly often. Um, my son's, my middle son's teeth are rotting out of his head. We're all having knee and joint problems, although Nancy has the worst problems. Um, go ahead, you can jump in any time you want. Well, we have been told that Waylon will have to have dentures at this point, and he is not, he won't be 19 until June of, uh, of this year. And Chad has got permanent lung damage. Um, Travis has got permanent sinus problems. How do these symptoms uh, relate to the respiratory system. Multiple wakings uh, of sleep, fatigue, brain fog, pain in legs, short-term memory loss, reading retention, um, and difficulty with exposures. It has nothing to do with the respiratory system. It has to do with the neurological system. It needs to be explained by psycho, neuro, immuno, endocrinology. It takes into effect the immune system. You will see later on down the line, or perhaps this has been uh, done now, I don't know, where you're going to have some of these people having autoimmune problems. Okay? You, uh, you have psychiatric problems on people who didn't have a psychiatric diagnosis before, let alone decrease in brain function, uh, quote unquote, the brain fog. There's definite, and I've seen this in other than the Alberton spell, there's a definite neural there's a brain injury that you see in a, an acute chemical exposure. I can uniquely draw the conclusion that uh, what Alberton seems to have shown shortly after and a few months after exposure, shortly afterward was, I think, what, eight weeks or something. It was June of 1996. Fits the pattern that we now are, have recognized in several other situations, populations, one in Arkansas, one in Texas, as well as one in Albert, it damages the brain. This will come out and say that that's what it does, it's what people are suffering from. And that's what we've seen now so many other times that, uh, you know, they haven't been as large a population
ammunition exposed, but there were eight people here and 13 in another place and several hundred in Henderson, Nevada, but we only got to examine seven. And when you put it all together, it says, well, there's a new pattern here of damage from chlorine that uh, cannot uh, be anything but uh, embraced as the pattern of what chlorine is doing. We do not have a specialist in environmental medicine with this point of view of all of the neurotoxicity and psychoneuroimmuno uh, endocrine problems that can happen with a toxic spill. We don't have anybody in Montana like that. We have some environmental doctors that come through occupational health, but um, they don't necessarily buy into this whole syndrome, and, which is true for the history of medicine. When somebody's out on the forefront of making discoveries, they're frequently badmouthed by the people that are on the in the middle of the road. This is my experience, and this again comes from patients and then some reading. I don't think it makes a heck of a lot of difference what chemical you're talking about as far as an acute insult. I've seen patients, many patients who are not in the Alberton spill who have had an acute exposure to a substance. It could be a pesticide, and there's a great deal of literature out there of people having one exposure to flea powder or whatever, and from then on becoming sensitive to perfumes, any sort of um, petrochemicals, um, smoke, to the point where uh, they can't live a normal life. I think that's what happened to some of the people in Alberton. The interesting question is, why didn't it happen to all of us? All of the, I, not me, because I wasn't there, but why didn't it happen to all of us? So what is the biological terrain in those people that allows uh, them to become so susceptible? I, there is a Nobel Prize in the future. The communications, uh, you know, we had the MRL spill, and then do you remember when the runaway train was yeah. Well, that's a pretty good example of a hundred or however many cars there were, 50 cars racing backwards to Missoula. And, you know, like one thing that bothers me the most is a car can be designated as an empty car. It's been unloaded, but still contain as much as 10% residue. So you've got a 5,000-gallon car of some serious chemical that could still have 500 gallons of this toxic stuff in it. A 1995 Federal Railway Administration safety report states that from 1990 through June of 1995, derailments accounted for the largest category of MRL train accidents. A total of 101 derailments occurred in five and a half years. In 1996, they had the second worst accident record for their class size of railroads. I don't keep bleach in my house at all anymore. I never used to think twice about picking up bleach at the store and bringing it home to use with my laundry for my wipes or even adding it to water for scrubbing. Never thought twice about it until this happened. I can't use it now. I use peroxide instead. I use peroxide for my wipes. Works great. So don't buy bleach anymore would be what I would tell anybody. When I heard about the Alberton spill last year, I thought it was going to be the beginning of the end of chlorine because I don't know how many more of these things this country can endure before it realizes how stupid it is for us to continue bleaching paper with chlorine, making plastic with chlorine, pouring chlorine on our soil and calling it pesticides. It makes no sense. In the beginning of this thing, we all live in the same community. And occasionally at the post office or at the town grocery store or at a football game, uh, you could talk to your neighbor and find out, how are you doing, this kind of thing. But when push comes to shove and your finances become a problem and you've gone through all of your resources and you just can't hang in there, you get separated and you lose contact with these people. They didn't know what they were dealing with, but they sure as heck knew where to get the people that did know what we were dealing with. I mean, I'm giving him that doubt now that I've been further into it. 
I think they knew what they were dealing with from the get-go, and that what they were dealing with was they didn't want to put out the bucks that they knew they were going to have to put out. And let's face it, Dirty Washington doesn't have enough money to buy this valley. And that's what it comes down to. It comes down to pure economics. This is a business. It's a business world. It's a corporate world. And that's what happened here. We are the liabilities of a corporate disaster. And the part that really scares the heck out of me is nothing has changed on this railroad. And at nighttime, I live on this track. I know what goes on. I've lived on this track all my life. And I'm telling you what, the worst stuff is traveling at night, and these people cook through here. They'll make my whole house shake sometimes. Those trains are traveling. And I don't care what their speed zones say or anything like that. There's something wrong in our system that we can't go and get more control on these railroads. This is what's tearing me apart, is that nobody gives a damn.